Welcome back, everyone. Before we dive in here today with our next guest, let me pose a few questions to you listeners. Who do you think of when I say the following statements? They get up at all hours of the morning and can easily have 12 to 14 hour workdays. Not only do they need excellent horse handling skills and knowledge of horses, but they also need to be extremely efficient with their time management. These people need to be great at packing, unpacking, and packing back up again numerous times in a show season. So here is one more hint. Aside from the riders, they are probably one of the most important group of people you can find at a horse show. So yes, if you said groom, you are correct. And my guest today has all sorts of experience grooming at the elite level or the A circuit level. Today, I will be chatting with my friend and lifelong horse lover, Pam Dorian. Pam caught the bug early in life, going from private lessons at the local riding school to owning her first horse and then hitting the riding circuit. What began at Robin Hill with Sue Pritchard blossomed into a long path that carried her forward in the horse world. Going from the children's hunter ring to junior jumpers was one thing, but Pam wasn't content to stay there. She followed up on her success as a junior when she returned from living in Western Canada, partnering with her horse Christmas until a year, sorry, a career ending injury to her mount forced her to consider her future in the equine industry. As it turns out, that future was in grooming. Asking Brenly Cohn about openings at Southern Ways was the start because Pam only wanted to work for one rider, Brenly's husband, Mac Cohn. This opened up a whole new career path for Pam as she got to tend to some elite equestrian athletes, such as Koku and Darius Five among them, while seeing the world through a groom's eyes. Welcome, Pam. I am so happy to have you join me today. Well, thank you so much for asking me. This is quite a thrill. <laughs> a bit of a walk down memory lane. This will be fun. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. So just to clarify, you are not grooming now. That's correct. Yeah. So th this was a, a career choice, a career path that lasted how long for you during what time? Um, I'm going to say a solid five years, and then I would sort of come back and do some guest grooming here and there, depending on which way the wind blew. But uh, yeah, so I, I kept my hand in it and could still do that if the time, if it was required. I, I mean, I wouldn't turn down a free flight to Europe for a, a big trip for sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's the one thing about you as, uh, you know, we've known each other for a long time. Um, yep. Yeah, you are always ready. It's like if they if Southern Ways needed a groom, you were boom, you were right there and ready to go wherever they wanted you to go and totally dedic dedicating yourself to the process and the horses. So yeah, that was something I've always admired about you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're very welcome. All right, so let's start this off with the first question. And honestly, I think it's one of the most important ones when talking about the... Um, the career choice or the job itself, however <laughs> anybody likes to look at it. Um, can you describe for me as succinctly as possible what a groom's mindset needs to be in order to work at the A circuit level? Uh, this, this question kind of threw me for a loop because the word succinct in there is not quite possible. Um, cause as you know, I mean, we do so many things at a horse show and you, you start, started off the segment by kind of highlighting everything that we do. Um, but I think the big thing is that grooming isn't just about being able to brush a horse and tacking it up correctly. It's really about putting your entire focus on the horse and that making sure that the horse is ready to do the job that the rider is asking you to do. And that, you know, by prioritizing that, then the horse rider combination has its best chance for success. So I think that sort of sums it up. That is pretty awesome. <laughs> Thank yes, you. Yes, that Thank is you. very well. <laughs> um, yeah, like, you know, when you when you talk about, because like, basically, you just put all the worth like a huge responsibility on your shoulders or anybody else's shoulders who does this at an elite level. Um, yeah. at an A circuit level, because like you said, and I've witnessed so many grooms over the years that it is so much more than just about, you know, tacking up and getting ready. Like 
the equipment needs to be precise. And, you know, it's something that you guys really mull over for each individual horse. Um, yeah. But yeah, like how you look after and how you prepare that horse has a huge part in the outcome in the ring. Am I correct? Definitely. I mean, you, you, you kind of carry over the stuff that you do at the home farm into the show environment. And so nothing should really change. So keeping your, your routine the same, whether it's the feeding times, um, whether it's the, the kind of boots that you wear at home to the show, you know, all that kind of stuff, keeping it super consistent means that the horse understands and is familiar with what's going on. So that horse shouldn't get upset. And you now you just get to deal with the, the rider's nerves, but hopefully the rider feels prepared. So going to the ring is more about, you know, the test rather than um, worrying about what could go wrong because we have as grooms have already done the legwork to get the horse ready for them. Yeah. And, you know, and like you said, I mean, and you've, and we will get into this a little bit further on in our conversation, but you've traveled around the world with horses. So, you know, when you say you have horses in the barn at home, and then you take said international horse and you stick them on a plane, <laughs> trying to yep. keep that horse in the same frame of mind and being comfortable must be a huge test. It is. It's also pretty awesome. Um, and not, not in the Valley Girl kind of awesome way, but um, it's really, truly amazing how a horse can go from one continent to another and compete and, and trust. And, you know, you, we box them up in these airplanes and you'd think, oh, they, they'd be like, no, I, there's no way. And you just have that worry that, you know, there's that horse at the, at the end of the show day where they're trying to get them on the trailer just to go home. But these guys walk on pallets and, and fly and there's no issue. They get off. They're like, okay, where are we going next? Because they trust what's going on. They know who you are and they, they, they've, develop that that bond with you that um, they go okay well this kind of is weird but let's do it yeah. so um, it's it's a really amazing job when you get to do it at that level especially for me anyway that was more exciting for me than than uh, than other stuff yeah okay so to go back to the question though like for somebody that might be listening to this and this is why you know the, the whole reason why I'm doing this podcast is to bring different elements mm -hmm. <laughs> in elements, life coaching, to bring different elements of the horse world um, for the readers to learn about or to, you know, be more informed of. And grooming <laughs> is such a huge, important part. So the aspect of mindset. So if anybody who's listening to this, and people might think this is more of an end of interview kind of question, but let's put it right up front. For anybody who's listening to this, that's thinking, huh, you know, that sounds, this sounds like a great job. I'd, I'd love to do it. And I ask what kind of mindset does a groom need to have to be able to work at the elite level? What can you share with us that gives you a little bit of an insight as to what kind of mindset people need to do to do this job as well as you've done it? Um, it still comes down to being focused on the horse. Um, that you are part of a team, that you are not the only person responsible, but you have responsibilities um, and you, you must be accountable. I think you also need to um, not be afraid to be vulnerable and say, you know what, I'm not familiar with that. Please show me what I need to do with this. Um, also, um, what I learned, you know, being at bigger shows was take advantage of all the knowledge around you. And there's so many people that have done this longer than it's so why not ask them, hey, what is that ointment that you're using? Or tell me more about that machine. And whether you're using it on the animals that you look after personally or not, doesn't really matter, but it's about, you know, expanding your knowledge and say, hey, you know what, maybe that could work down the road. Um, you have to be committed. You have to be able to roll with the punches. Um, having good days and bad days is absolutely part of it, whether you're a groom or the rider. Um, you know, there's always ebbs and flows to the business at, at all aspects, all ends of it. And so I, you know, being able to weather those storms is super important. So being a little gritty, you know, oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially when, you know, you're at a show and it's teeming down rain or, you know, you yeah. just gotta, like you said, you gotta roll with the punches. Yep. So, you know, we've, if, if people listening in, in Ontario, you've gone to Paul Grave in May, you know that you're bringing your winter and your summer gear with you. And, and that's part of being prepared. You like have your sunscreen, have your bug spray, but also have your toque and hat and gloves because it could snow. So, yeah. you know, 
it's just, it's super important to be prepared and um, kind of be ready for anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I do have to say, before we move on to the next question, I mean, in, in almost 23 years of massaging and yes. having been in many elite barns, but spending a large number of years in Southern ways myself, um, I can, I can honestly say that I've seen a lot of overturn in staff in different barns. And it's honestly because people just don't understand how hard the job is. And I have honestly, right off the top, I will say that grooms are the hardest working individuals out there on general, like the, the really good ones who are committed and they are committed to these horses and they provide everything that these horses need. And I just want to give a huge shout out and kudos to all of those pros of you guys that I have met and known over the years, because you're also so good at what you do that when I show up to massage these horses, you guys set my experience up, right? Mm. So, you know, the really good ones and the really, you know, responsible ones are like, oh, Tracy's here. Let's get that horse. Let's set her up, that kind of thing. And it just made, like you said, it's a whole team approach and, I will just say I've very much appreciated it over the years. <laughs> well, you're welcome. And I think that's that also goes to the rhythm of a barn and understanding, you know, respecting professionals that go in and out of these barns. Um, you know, a good groom makes the job look easy. And I think that can be sort of challenging for somebody that's just thinking, hey, you know what, my horse is hurt, so let's get into grooming. Or, um, you know, I've always loved horses. I want to learn more about it. It's not an easy job and your body breaks down and you don't always get to sit down for your 30 minutes for lunch. In fact, you're probably eating a sandwich or an apple while you're pulling a horse out to the paddock. So, you know, that's the kind of resilience um, that you need to to have and um, you know you can also have a really good time with it at, as well so uh, I don't want to make it sound like it's you know a, a beast of a job but um, it is physical labor so you need to be ready for that yeah exactly yeah yeah okay so you went from being a rider with big aspirations to dealing with a significant course deviation no pun intended, yeah. because it was significant uh, when your horse Christmas got hurt you yep. did something atypical of someone in your situation by becoming a groom at the elite level. What do you think that says about you? Uh, I think that my parents raised somebody that could, um, you know, handle a lot of adversity um, because life is handle it throws that at you. And um, I wasn't prepared to let my the, the injury that happened to my horse you know squashed my love for the sport and riding and you know being involved in it in some way shape or form and so um i thought well what else can i do and uh this seemed to be uh, a really great way to be more entrenched in it than than ever um you know was i going to be on the canadian team at that point in my life absolutely not you know so um you know but how else could i be part of this industry that i've loved for so many years and that was that yeah well, I, I love, you know, the adversity, like you said, and, and like I, you know, say to the listeners, you and I have known each other a long time. You are a goer. You are very focused. And when you put your mind to something, it gets done. So, you know, to have that, like you said, you weren't going to the Olympics, but you still had goals. Yeah. And, and, you know, to have that completely wiped out after a solid year of trying to rehab your horse. Um, yeah. Yeah, that had to have been a bit of a blow. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of, um, I love the fact, you know, that you included your your upbringing, because, you know, what are you going to do with the situation? So you, you might as well go learn and learn more. Yeah, it's sort of that old adage, you know, when life throws, gives you lemonades or gives you lemons, what are you going to make? Lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> or some people might say add vodka. Well, <laughs> 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 might have been known to add that too, but you know. <laughs> There's always it's, an option, right? Always, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think it's just really important to to, you know, not get so beaten down by something that you're facing and and figure out if there's a solution to it and what what is possible what could still bring you some kind of joy or um you know how do you how do you evolve or revolve around a situation and um you know it's it, there's always going to be uh, another opportunity through that so look for it that's mm -hmm. you know yeah. good advice absolutely if one door shuts down you know you know, th there's another one ready to open up for you. You just have to be able to reframe it and yeah. 
you know, and take a different look at it for yourself. And I mean, I think I actually, you know, preparing for this and thinking of, you know, the span of years that we've known each other. I think yeah. I remember the very first day that we met. I think, wasn't that like at the, what was sure. Tournament of sure. Champions out at what is the RCRA place yep. of New Market? Yes. And yeah, I remember, I remember that. That was, that was our introduction and you were yeah. right in there. You were ready to, <laughs> you were ready to learn as much as you could. And yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Well, I thought of that was because I took so much pride in the job that I did. And, and, and when this is part of maybe part of B of the answer, like what does it take to be a good groom is that you do have to have pride in your job and be thoughtful and mindful of the, the situation that you're in and being respectful and responsible to the animal and everything that got done was going to be a reflection of me. And so um, I, I took great pride in my work because I wanted somebody to say, Hey, she really did a great job or your horse was ready. And, and, you know, the rider being more comfortable because of that. So, you know, there, there's a lot of self respect and um and that you can garnish from um that from this kind of experience as well yeah absolutely yeah all right so here's the okay part. <laughs> can, can you share with us a little bit about the two main horses that you were in that were in your care during your time working at southern ways and what kind of relationships you had with them so let's start with the first one koku as we all affectionately known as coconut. Yes. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, when I started with Mac, um, he had um, Alute and Koku, and Alute was still the head honcho. He was retired shortly after I started. So Koku became my main horse. And um, I definitely know that I have a thing for mares. And uh, so it was really easy to, to get close to her. She was... Um, you know, kind of this, you know, she was the boss mare, really, if you remember. And yeah. uh, I don't know that, it, you know, maybe your memory is better than mine, but I don't know that she selected people, but I definitely know that she let me in. And um, she absolutely loved Mac to death. And so it was really easy to kind of fit into that triangle and, um, you know, make her happy. Um, he made her happy. So she just outperformed everything. And uh, um, so she was a really special horse for sure. And she took me to a bunch of really big competitions. So um, that was, you know, my first year going, like first time going to Florida and going as a, you know, at this level and uh, going to Spruce Meadows and then getting to go to the World Equestrian Games with her. And it's like, you know, you sit there and you go, where am I? How did I even get here? <laughs> um, and then the next one was Darius as you also worked on. I mean, he was the feisty little son of a gun. And like, you know, he had a, a bit of like the Napoleon uh, syndrome. He's so little, but so fiery. And I think he was known across the country for the kind of quality of animal that he was. And, um, you know, I had to move from being Max Groom to being Mark's Groom, Mark Samuel, who has been one of Max's longest time supporters and friends of, of him and the, uh, Southern Ways. And um, Mark made, uh, was on the team for the Pan Ams. And we went to the Dominican and he was actually the first rider to secure the individual spot for Canada uh, at, at Athens uh, the following year. So again, another really big highlight to be part of that, um, to be part of a Canadian team event and realize that, you know, I mean, there was no pressure on Mark whatsoever in that moment. And he pulled through and it was, you know, it was a really great team experience. And um, there's a lot of joy and a lot of relief. And um, it's just, it's neat to be part of those kinds of um, atmospheres. That's what I really, I love those kinds of things for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, <laughs> Koku was my first, you yeah. know, uh, <laughs> that type of elite level horse when I first started my massaging career and what an absolute gift it was like, and she was such a, such a little princess yes. in, so many, <laughs> in so many ways. Um, she was absolutely wonderful. And of course, you know, being horse lovers, we, we fall in love with them. Yeah. And Pam, do you remember that conversation? Do you remember that phone call? after Koku was sold to the Ugh. States. Oh my goodness. You, you called me and you said, Tracy, are you sitting down? And immediately I was just like, 
oh my God. And you said, yeah. coconut's been sold. And I swear you and I spent the next 10, 20 minutes crying <laughs> on the phone. I had, I had to give her a bath crying and Max yeah. like, what's wrong with you? I said, it's Goku. Yeah. <laughs> mess, you know, but that's how attached I got to these animals. And I think that made a huge difference in, in, you know, being able to weather all of the, the stuff that goes along with grooming, the long hours and having to, to hand walk the colics and, yeah. you know, with the barrier and all that kind of stuff. When you have that kind of connection with an animal, yeah. I mean, there's nothing better. No, it was amazing. And, and, you know, after that, I kind of had to, I, I think I continued to cry and was quite upset for about two days. And then I finally sort of gave, gave myself a shake and said, look, Mitchell, if you're going to be <laughs> massaging these kinds of horses, this is going to happen. It's, it's a reality yeah. of the job, um, yeah. but it can't stop you from yeah. putting your heart into it. And because that's the only way you connect with these horses. Yeah. Um, and the same thing, I had the same experience with Darius. Oh my goodness. I loved that little guy. Um, yeah. because you know, like I remember when I first started working on him, Max, like, all right, Trace, just watch this guy. He's, he's got a bit of an edge to him. And I'm like, okay. He's, you know, so I was very cautious. And then, then he'd start, he had people. He was, yeah. he was a horse who chose his people. And, uh, he and I had a very long relationship and he knew what I was there for. And, mm -hmm. It was his time and I just, yeah, so many awesome, awesome memories with those guys. And there was one other horse that you did groom. It was Mr. Uh, Olay. It was Olay. Yep. Yeah. Um, he pulled, came off the truck from Florida and Max said, here, this one's yours. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so it was pretty neat to, to get, be part of his early career. And, um, you know, one funny thing, I remember riding him around and at Spruce in the week off and, you know, we typical July day where it was hailing and the, the hail was pounding off of my helmet, but it was also hitting him. And he thought I was hitting him. I'm like, no, no, we're going to go for another, the trees, you know, so sorry, buddy. <laughs> but, you know, he was, he was sensitive and, and caring and, um, you know, he, he developed an attitude as well later on, but, um, you know, he was a wonderful animal to deal with. Yeah. It was fun yeah. watching him blossom. And yeah. I, I think like, again, like, you know, learning and all the horses I've known over the years. I mean, this is why we're having this conversation because who knows some of these horses better. Okay. Yes. Riders, but, but the grooms, they spend yeah. all the time with them. And, um, yeah, like you know, watching a young horse come up with all sorts of talent and watching them blossom and find yeah. their big boy pants or their big girl pants and go, you know what? I'm like going in the ring and I'm doing my job is just so exciting. Yeah, and I think the groom has a really important part in that because they're doing all of the aftercare, the pre-care, and so the horse starts to feel really special and you kind of boost their, give them their confidence in, in making their bodies feel good and following how they travel and go, you know what, I don't know that this saddle is fitting as well as it once did, or, um, you know, maybe we need to change this up, or the, we've got a boot rub, or or whatever it might be you know by but by having your eyes on every part of the horse you get to understand their 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 bodies you know I kind of repeat myself but it's it's really important to be able to recognize when things are going well and when things are like wait I don't think he's eating well or the poop doesn't look the same or didn't drink much water and you being part of that horse rider team is is only going to you know strengthen the success I think yeah. yep for sure yeah so you have had the great opportunity to do a lot of traveling as a groom you have been to the world equestrian games as you mentioned in Spain you have been to the Pan Am games and you have had the chance to groom at such events as the Royal and the Nations Cup final in Barcelona with that, I imagine that required you to wear a lot of different hats at different times of your tra of your travels, especially. So what are your thoughts when I say that? Um, there are not enough hats to be able to pack in a trunk. That's the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> we are like your own personal travel there's restrictions to things that you can put in the trunk and and uh you do get weighed so it's really important to be you know 
pack carefully. Um, but it's like I said in the beginning, you know, you've got your home base and you've got your show and, you know, making sure that you're taking everything that you would use at home with you and, you know, being mindful about what you do need and what you don't need and where you're going to be. And if you're going to Europe, you know, is it the same grain or can you bring grain? Is it the same kind of, hey, what else do I need to supplement this? You know, am I able to buy things while I'm there or do I need to pack everything? And so you got a lot of preparation, um, a lot of time time management, um, you know, being able to reverse engineer things, becoming solutions oriented, um, you know, how who, find your helpers in the crowd, like who's the person that can get you uh, to the shipper or to the, the team vet, um, you know, just understanding sort of, you know, the lay of the land a little bit in that way, you're not left floundering and feeling like a completely lost individual. So, um, you know, stick to somebody who's been there before and, and kind of knows what, what they're doing. And then you sort of, you know, pair at them and you're like, okay, I can do this, you know? So it's it, just cause I've been there once doesn't mean that it isn't you know, something new every time, but you get a little bit more experience each time you do it and you go, okay, here's the checklist. All right. I wish I had this last time. This is what I'm going to add to the next time, next go round. And, and it's just, making lists making so many lists <laughs> Did I <make> lists <laughs> so so your first trip to to weg you know oh. in, in spain you know like that's that's a that's more than just a trip to florida and yeah. and i remember when you got home you had pictures and i got a couple of copies of these pictures and the one picture that i just love is yes i have some of coconut flying over jumps but the other one is of you and mac and coconut mm -hmm. coco walking yeah. in the pouring yeah. rain and the three of you look miserable <laughs> tell me about that experience halfway around the world in such um a heightened moment of expectation oh you're making me relive it <laughs> um so that was an interesting show. I mean, the trip over there, I could write a book on. I mean, it, I still have the notes, I think, because I kept them. It was just unbelievable, the, the things that we went through to get there. Um, I think, you know, trying to just stay focused that we're at a horse show and not put that we're at a horse show in, in Spain. And this is the reason why we're here uh, on top of all of that, you know, get your horse ready the same way, you know, warm them up the same way. Don't deviate from that plan because there's no need to. And that way, if I'm staying calm, keeps the horse calm and then Matt can focus or the rider can focus on their job entirely. Um, we had great groom's accommodation. There were six of us in one little um, cabana and it poured rain probably the entire seven days that we were there at the showground. So we were all wet. Everything was wet. It was absolutely miserable. But in those moments of going to the ring, you're focused on the horse and you have to forget that your jeans are drenched and they're the <laughs> the water is seeping down into your running shoes and you know there's water running down your back like you just have to forget about it and again you're there to make sure the horse is ready wow yeah that is that is awesome yeah um so in in the world of horses it is very safe to say that anything can happen and at any time and being able to adjust or pivot is a must. Um, what kind of adversity have you faced on the job? And can you tell us about a, well, that happened kind of moment <laughs> and how you made adjustments? Oh gosh, you know, if, any, if anyone who's been in this industry or part of this sport for any length of time has faced adversity, has dealt with the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs, things don't go to plan. And, you know, it's really, it just still comes back to taking like pressing pause. How can you make, find what's the solution in this? What do I need to address first? And then, you know, what's the game plan for the next 30 days, 60 days? And I'm thinking maybe, you know, not just with my my time at Southern Ways, but in general that, you know, horses get hurt, for example, what is the, the impact of this injury on the animal, on their career, on the rider? Um, and I think 
you, you have to separate your heart from your head and, you know, have like you and I had that cry about knowing that Goku was sold. And yeah. then I can't let her go. Um, you know, that would probably be one of the first things that I dealt with, uh, but I can't let her go and, um, and not still have done my job to the very last day you know, because that's still a reflection of me and I'm st I am still am responsible to her. And, um, you know, it was great being able to get a picture of where, um, her retirement, still getting clipped. And she was, what, you know, 25 years old or 27 years old or something. Yeah, I so remember you sent me that picture. It was great. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think it really comes down to like disconnecting the emotion from things and going, okay, what, what needs to happen next you know and i think a lot of that for me comes from you know maybe a lot of my personality um i'm fairly pragmatic <laughs> uh, but you know i i spent a lot of time being a paramedic and a ski patroller when i lived out west and so you know having to drown out all the noise um and then focus just on the situation and how to manage that that kind of transfers over into so many things in life and so whether it's you know, a horse injury or colic or changing barns or um, horses being sold, you, you know, you apply those same kind of rules. That's crisis management. And I completely yeah. forgot about your history doing that out West. That's yeah. solid. I mean, that's, those are characteristics that, you know, you want in someone when it comes to those moments that are like, holy crap, I can't believe this just happened. So yeah. do you have an experience that you can share like, I think you were saying something about, you know, how you got everybody on the plane and actually made it to where you were, you were going. Is there, is that oh. a example of that or do you, what else do you have? Yeah, sure. I mean, like it's, it was, a lot of it was out of our hands because we were part of the, the caravan on a plane, but you know, it was just, I can't even say it was a comedy of errors. It was, it was like a, a a bad play that you just wanted to, to be able to get up out of your seat and go. I mean, it started from how the plane was packed in Toronto to um, not having the weight distribution in the plane correctly. So having to land in, in Gander so that we could refuel to make it to Madrid and we get there and it is so hot that, and we can't deplane. And so we put bring in these um, massive air conditioning tubes. And of course, there's one at one end of each other, end of the, the, the plane and our horses are right at the very back. So our horses got freezing cold while the middle horses are still steaming hot. And we're on the tarmac for four hours while the, the team vets or the, the, the Spanish vets are still are drawing blood. It's like, well, we had blood drawn in Toronto. So why are you drawing it again? Send us on our way. <laughs> so I think the whole trip was like, an, it feels like it was, I think 19 hours. And, you know, by the time we got up from Madrid to Sevilla that we had to still get on a truck to get to the staging area in Montemedio. And I mean, it was, it was a marathon. And I think being really uh, able to just, you know, having a sort of a, um, an understanding of how long it's going to take to get from here to here to here, you sort of, you have some ex expectations or you, you, you can sort of comp compartmentalize some things, but um, just being able to adapt to that and go, okay, we've got this and then we have that, and then this is going to happen and, um, you know, deal with what we can at the end. And it was, it was a very much a nightmare trip. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and throughout our conversation, um, I guess in a way, as I'm thinking about it, we've made it sound like a very solitary job. But in those instances, you have been in situations where you are a part of a team. Definitely. So, you know, even so you are one of what, three or four other grooms that are making this journey representing Canada at these mm -hmm. um, events. Um, what's that like? You're, you're individuals, yet you're working as a team. Do, do you draw off of each other for anything? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, you, there's, you go there with how you manage your horse and you don't change that plan. Um, you, and likewise for the other people, because they all have a different program than what you've got. So you're not there to um, judge or, um, you know, d uh, persuade a, an alternate point of view um, you're there to say okay 
you know, you you look like you're running behind. What can I do to help? You pitch in by bathing, or um, if they let you wrap their horse, great. Or um, let me clean your tack for you. Um, you know, it, it just things like that that can keep you guys supported. Because as you've seen at the barns, um, at the end of the day, Tack Mountain is a thing, and it's the last <laughs> thing on earth that you want to deal with. Um, you just want to get out and go home because you're 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 done. And this is the same kind of thing, even though you've got one or two horses at an international show like that, you still don't want to be holding anybody else up, especially because we travel together and you're going to the same hotel or the same accommodation. So um, you, you want to work together to make sure that everybody gets out and stays happy. And, um, you know, whatever you can do to make that happen is really important. Yeah. Like it's, it's uh, for four different riders representing the country, you know, with the alternate kind of thing. Um, but yeah, you are team Canada and it's, yeah. uh, it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic from, from what mm -hmm. I've seen, I've never traveled anything farther than either out to Spruce or down to Florida, but still like for a nation's cup at the Royal, you know, observing that and just watching how, um, the team riders, like they work with each other and how the grooms play a part in it all. It's, uh, it's very yeah. rewarding and very exciting to see. Yeah, I mean, each team groom um, is, is equally dedicated to their horse and to their rider. So no one's slacking off, no one's phoning it in. Um, everybody understands the stakes and, um, you know, they, they're there for the love of the sport and to to be the best, help their rider, a horse rider combination be the best version of themselves. So um, it's neat to be part of that. Maybe you're not the rider, but you still get the same kind of um, buzz from doing, from being that, yeah. Yes, I, I just have to, I have another little memory. Remember in the summer of 2004 out at Spruce with our little friend Darius? <laughs> he won that class. And oh. Uh, oh my goodness, that was an experience I will never forget. And yeah. it was just such an honor to to watch those two work together. And uh, yeah, that was that was a long summer, but it ended on a very good note. It did. I mean, we didn't get to, we weren't selected for Athens, but uh, finishing up with that win was amazing. I, I remember when um, Peter Howard came down through the shoot because he'd been watching the class and he said, Mac, there's a five in that last line. And Mac's like, no, there isn't. He see, Peter said, yes, it's there. He goes, really? <laughs> so it was neat to see those two play off each other. And then, you know, as Mac's going through the, the, the jump off and, and I could see it happening. He's like, he's landing, he's doing the five and there it was. Yeah. And so he, the class and you know so being able to go into the the international ring and hold your horse and Matt hoist, hoisting the oh, the yeah. cup I mean it was it was a pretty amazing moment yeah. for sure and I think the one thing I will say I I learn by working on horses at this level is that their focus like for instance watching Darius with his partner his rider go after that last jump with the look on their faces. I was looking at the pictures of it the other day. I still have the pictures. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. That, yeah. that, that horse and rider team, they were going for it and nothing was going to stop them. It was just yeah. so exciting. And yes, it was so awesome to see you in that ring with them because I knew how much effort that you had spent days and nights worrying over that horse, just making sure that he was the happiest little guy he could be. <laughs> Darius in the same sentence. I, I don't know. know. It all but... depended on the day. <laughs> all right. So one last question here. After everything okay. you have invested in this part of your life, what did you find the most rewarding about the job? And what can you look back and say was the one thing you most learned about yourself? Uh, I've struggled a little bit about with the part B of this question. Um, but the most rewarding, I'd say, um, you know, um, as a junior rider, Mac was one of the people that I really respected and looked up to the most. And um, being able to work in that environment was pretty um it was it was a pretty amazing experience and I'm losing my I've, I've lost a little bit of my vocabulary there but um I think being able to or earning his respect and um having a, that mutual relationship where he would say this needs to get done and there was a, a complete trust that 
everything was going to go to plan or that everything was, would be executed was, was um, you know, pretty, I'm going to say the word amazing again, again, I'm losing my, <laughs> my, my thesaurus here. Um, but it, 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 it's, it was very rewarding to have that respect returned and, um, you know, from somebody that I really admired so much. So that was probably the, the, the most rewarding thing about my entire experience and being, being like being trusted with that, uh, yes. that, level of of expectation I guess um what have I learned the most uh about you about me gosh you're putting me in the spot here um <laughs> welcome to my podcast <laughs> yeah thank you um you know I didn't start off grooming as a really young person I'd already had a fair amount of life experience um so I kind of already knew that I was resilient and I could get things done and I was not afraid of hard work and um I think I think understanding later on after looking back over the years I think that because it's been said back to me that um, I've made a difference in people's lives. And um, that was perhaps a rewarding experience, but also um, learning that I had some kind of impact influence, um, I, I, education, I don't know what the right sort of group of words is, but understanding that I had been able to make a difference in someone else's life has also been um, something that I didn't know that I was going to be doing at the same time. Could it be described as something like paying it forward? Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, not everybody wants to do it at that level and, you know, understanding that that's okay too. Um, but if you're going to choose this as a summer job or even a five-year job, be the best version of yourself within that and don't be afraid to ask the questions and don't you know it's it's okay to get things wrong but learn from it and and respect the the process and respect the horses through it yeah 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 i mean that's ultimately why you're there that's yeah it's those horses that make those riders great yeah yeah i mean the rider obviously has an impact on the horses but um it's that team and I can honestly say, like I said, I've, I've known many a groom in my day and, you know, like de developing a great relationship with all of you guys was very important to me. It, and honestly, it doesn't matter what level of barn I'm going into. I always make a solid conscious effort to know the names of every single person I'm going to be dealing with because guaranteed at some point in time during the day, they're going to feel underappreciated, overworked. <laughs> <laughs> and I want them to know that I appreciate them as a professional yeah. walking into that barn. And um, I, I remember one time it was a very hot day in the summer and a team riders like, Tracy, can you just go back to the barn and massage one more horse for me? And I'm like, Oh my goodness. Oh. Okay. So I got in my car, I left the show, I went back to their barn and the, she at least gave the um, grooms at the barn a heads up. And these guys were awesome. They had the horse in the cross ties and three fans set up. Uh -huh. <laughs> So I was completely looked after. So it's that kind of experience. And you know what? That's that's what relationship is all about in the yeah. horse industry. You know, like I said, there's so much individualism going on, but when it comes down to it, you know, we're all a community and we all, you know, benefit from working with each other. For sure. I mean, like, you know, I, I you've we've spoken a little bit about individual versus team and, you, you know, yes, you have sort of charge of your specific animals, but that doesn't mean that you are working by yourself in within the barn and you still have to manage those horses within the rhythm of the barn. And so, you know, you have to be able to either you know, like play well in the sandbox, but also, um, you know, be respectful and considerate of the people that you're also working around. Um, so um, because that's also going to transfer over into how the horses respond. So, um, how, you know, keeping good energy in the barn is really, really important. And I will, I will end on this note. Um, I remember a couple of times, one person in particular a long time ago was kind of bad mouthing a horse. 
like saying, oh, you lazy this, you lazy that, and this poor horse. And I kind of said to her, this was new in my career, but I took a moment and said, do you realize that that horse relies on you and your attitude to look after it on a daily basis? Can you imagine what that horse feels like knowing that it has you looking after it with that sort of interaction and that energy? Um, so exactly, the, the, the horses rely on their caretakers for everything. And yeah. the energy based and what they get back is is definitely a part of it. So, yeah. And uh, you were always very, very good to your horses. So, yeah. I <laughs> still do. Yes. Yes, you do. Yeah. Well, Pam, I know you are not an official groom, as said, like in you, you've, you've hung up, you've retired from grooming sort of officially, but if anybody has any questions, if there are any, you know, aspiring grooms out there, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, well, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so those are easy to find. I, I don't have a private profile or anything like that. Um, you know, it's, uh, you can, you know, DM, it's all good. You know, I'm, I'm available to answer any questions and understand or help you navigate, you know, how to be a better groom and how to navigate the, the politics of grooming and uh, the, the horse show life and, you know, figure out different tips and tricks. I mean, there's, there are also so many good, really good grooms out there that it's mm -hmm. not just about me, but there's, you know, I think of like Lauren Eames and Kath Long and Danny Ingrata, you know, just some really solid people in this business. And yeah, um, darn me, oh. Dom, Dominique Maida, she was pretty awesome too. So yeah. yeah, if you get the chance to go to a horse show, even just walk up and down the aisles and, and ask, stop a groom and say, hey, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Like, you know, it's it's important that we keep imparting knowledge on on people and, and sort of groom the next generation of 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 people that want to look after the horses. Exactly. Well, that's yeah. a great way to great way to end this fun conversation. And so what what I will do is I'll for people listening um your information, can I give like an email and your information on Facebook, uh, sorry, sure. on the show notes? Sure. Awesome. All right. Yep. Okay, my friend, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me.